This examination we're going to discuss is the abdominal examination. Just reminding about some anatomy, when we think about dividing up the abdomen, very commonly you're going to divide it up into nine areas with two flanks, being an anterior positioning with the patient's right hand side, the patient's left hand side. When you think about each one of these areas, remember commonly what organs are in each area within the right upper quadrant of the abdomen having portions of the stomach and the liver and gallbladder, epigastric having portions of the pancreas and the stomach, left upper quadrant having the presence of the spleen as well as the right upper, the epigastric and the left upper all having transverse colon with the hepatic flexure and the splenic flexure of the colon. Moving down to our next level, the right middle quadrant and left middle quadrant mainly have your ascending and descending portions of the colon. Your umbilical or umbilicus area having a large amount of your small intestines. Looking at the right lower quadrant having your appendix suprapubically, of course having the top of your bladder and left lower quadrant having the inf most inferior aspect of the descending colon as well as having the sigmoid colon. When we look at the presence you would then for the kidneys you would basically project into the board for one kidney on the right hand side being right about here and then your left hand side being right about here. When we look at this anatomical structures as well, remembering in a female that you have the presence of the ovaries as well as the top of the uterus. Again, of course, when we're going to do our abdominal examination, you want to make sure that you have your patient adequately draped to expose their abdomen. Many times having the patient bend their knees under the drape allows the normal lordosis of the lumbar spine and the position of the sacrum to be maintained, alleviating some of the tension that people can have in their lower spine during such examinations. We want to adequately expose so we can do a visual examination of the abdomen. In some people, you will be able to see the aortic pulsation directly down the middle of the abdomen. In some people, you may actually be able to see peristaltic action, all that, though that would be relatively rare. Being able to see the aortic pulsation or the bottom of the heart and a pulsation here is not necessarily abnormal. Once we visualize the abdomen, looking for scars, looking for bruising, looking for masses or distension, remembering that a Bruising around the umbilicus is indicative of what's called the Cullen sign. This is a sign of retroperitoneal bleed or pancreatic bleed. When we look on the patient's flank through this area, if you have bruising over here, this is called Gray-Turner sign. Gray-Turner sign, which would be bruising in this area, in the lower flank, in a triangular shape, is also another sign of retroperitoneal bleed. We want to observe in our look, listen, and feel scenario first. We then go and listen. We want to take between 10 and 15 seconds with the diaphragm of our stethoscope, listening in multiple spots, remembering our anatomy. Now you can do right upper, right lower, left lower, left upper, taking about 15 to 20 seconds again. If you have a quiet abdomen, you ha may have to actually just st set your stethoscope down and just take a couple seconds longer to make sure that you do have adequate ball sounds. In the presence of a partial or threatened bowel obstruction, very often you're going to hear hyper-resonant or pingy bowel sounds. In patients that have gastroenteritis or diarrhea, you're going to have very frequent copious bowel sounds. If you can hear bowel sounds through the abdominal wall without your stethoscope, that is referred to as borborygmi. As we then move beyond our visualization, you can then move on to palpation. 
Again, remembering our organs in our different quadrants, we start with a gentle light palpation in each area. Notice how I'm using two hands. This makes it less likely that I'm stabbing the patient with my fingers and I get a better palpatory experience. So the first time you do a light, then you go and do a deeper palpation. I tend to do it in a graph-like approach if I'm just doing a normal examination on a patient following the same anatomy structure that we talked about just a few minutes ago. I would recommend that if you have a situation like a person complaining of right lower quadrant pain, start in the quadrant farthest away from where you're going to be working. The reason you do that is if you immediately go to the area of pain, when you palpate that, the patient will guard and then the rest of your examination is gonna be affected. As we're talking about the rest of the examination, we want to remember next, once we've checked for guarding, which guarding is an involuntary contracture of the abdominal muscles resulting from peritoneal irritation, we will then go and percuss for the presence of the liver. Just like we did on the chest wall, our plexometer finger is going to tap. You'll notice that the sound on the open vault of the abdomen resonates. As we move over, it becomes dull. You palpate in an upward direction to catch the bottom of the liver. You then start elevated just below the breast and you palpate downward and then you note in reference to the ribs where the bottom margin of the liver is. Normally the liver should not extend below the rib margin. If it does, you can characterize it. I have measured my finger. My finger is two centimeters. So depending on how far below the rib margin, how many fingers I have, this would be four centimeters below the rib margin. And that's how you would notate it. Not two fingers below the rib margin, but in my case, four centimeters below the rib margin. After you've percussed for the liver, you can then also do what's called the liver scratch test. The liver scratch test is where you place your stethoscope on the abdominal wall over where you would expect the liver to be. You then gently scratch on the abdominal wall and when the tone of the scratching changes, that lets you know where that margin of the liver is. Another test for the liver is what is called the Murphy's sign. This is for testing for gallbladder pathology. You have the person take a deep breath. As they're taking their deep breath, you have them exhale. When they exhale, you wrap your fingers in a hook-like manner underneath the rib cage and have them take another breath. If they have gallbladder pathology, you're forcing the gallbladder up against the bottom of the liver and against the pressure of the diaphragm. So if you smush the gallbladder up and there is gallbladder pathology, the person's gonna complain of pain or they're gonna arrest the breath. The arresting of the breath or the presence of pain on the examination is a positive Murphy's sign. We next wanna look at palpating a few special tests one of those special tests is going to be palpating the aorta. And the easiest way to do that is to place a thumb and finger on the abdominal wall. You can do it super umbilically or under the umbilicus. I find most success super umbilically. And you feel the sides of the pulsation. Once you've felt how wide it is, and usually about two to three centimeters is normal. Sometimes you can have them as high as four, you should not be concerned. But then you can also take your diaphragm, place it directly over that, and auscultate for abdominal aortic bruits. Remembering, like in the carotid artery, in the aorta, a bruit is caused by turbulence within the flow, loss of laminar flow, because of a stenotic or reduced flow region. 
We can also add a few more other tests that allow us to specifically look for other pathology. We talked about the Murphy sign for the liver pathology. McBurney's is going to be, or the McBurney's sign is going from the anterior superior iliac spine drawing a line to the umbilicus. Approximately two thirds of the way from the umbilicus to the ASIS is McBurney's point. McBurney's sign is when you press here, the patient complains of pain. This is specific for appendicitis in that you can have what's called rebound tenderness. You press and hold it, the patient may say that the pain is getting better, but then when you briskly release, the patient complains that the pain is worse when you briskly release. That is called rebound tenderness. The next one we're going to talk about is Rosvig's sign. Rosvig's sign is characterized, again for appendicitis, you press evenly on the left lower quadrant and patients have referred pain to the right lower quadrant. Again, Rosvig sign, you press on the left lower quadrant and the patient complains of pain on the right lower quadrant. Another special sign is called the obturator sign. This is where you flex the patient's thigh to the hip with the knee bent. You rotate the leg internally, which is stretches the internal obturator muscle. In this situation, I'm going to keep the patient draped. I then flex the patient's knee, and using my lower leg, I rotate it interiorly. Now I would do this on the right hand side of the patient. I'm doing it at the left just for observation purposes. Again, you're doing it on the right hand side, but again, the knee is flexed, the leg is internally rotated, the thigh is internally rotated. That creates pain over where the appendix is. Our next is going to be the psoas sign. The psoas sign, another sign of appendicitis, is you're going to have the patient in a supine position. You're going to have them raise the knee on the right hand side with the right leg extended. If you could extend your right leg, please. I'm then going to hold their left ASIS and have them raise their right knee against my hand. If you guys can see that, let's lower this down a little bit more. Okay, and they're gonna raise their leg against my hand. What this does, you can go ahead and relax, is that activates the psoas muscle complex. The appendix lays directly against the psoas muscle complex. If it's inflamed or there's peritoneal irritation and I have that person activated, pain on the right lower quadrant is going to be indicative for a positive psoas sign. So for our special tests, we've talked about our Murphy sign for our gallbladder pathology, our McBurney's point, and McBurney's sign with increased rebound tenderness for appendix, our obturator sign with the knee flexed, and internally rotating the thigh. And then finally, our psoas sign, raise your right knee against my hand while stabilizing the left ASIS and relax. That activates the iliopsoas complex, which is called the psoas sign. As the last part, or actually, you can do this when you lay the person down initially or you can do it at the end of your examination. Can be palpating for the kidneys. The way you do it is you put one hand into the lumbar spine, just below the ribs. You take the other hand and you press the two hands together, gently rolling the anterior hand to side to side. On most people, actually I can feel her kidney. And then you would do that on both sides. Don't worry, you may not be able to feel the kidney, but this is how you're going to do it 
away from the patient's abdomen, pressing upward posteriorly in a posterior anterior, from the anterior aspect pushing posteriorly and moving back and forth. To finish off our kidney examination, you can again do this portion of the kidney examination when you have the person in a seated position as opposed to having them lay down and sit back up. But what you can do then is you look right here at the costovertebral angle. Right there is where the kidney is. So in situations where you're worried about kidney infections, kidney stones, pyelonephritis, you're then going to take with the heel of your hand and strike. You're not trying to go through the person, it's a brisk strike. You do it on both sides, asking the person, does this feel tender? Does this feel tender? Again, a positive punch sign is going to be your kidney punch is where the patient states that they have pain when you do that. Sometimes all you have to do when they have a really bad kidney infection is when you're palpating in the lumbar spine and you press here and they go, ah, and they try to come away from your hand. But the punch is our definite test. So we had talked about several different tests that you can do for appendicitis. And the reason you're looking at my feet is that if someone has peritoneal irritation from an appendix, what you can actually do before you have them lay down as they're walking to the bed is to move onto one foot and jump. That shock will send a shock up through their psoas complex causing pain in their abdomen. You can also do this if the patient is in a supine position by striking the bottom of their feet. It's a similar to the jump test. Be careful though if you've got somebody who's really sick and you're asking them to jump because it could have bad outcomes.